welcome to What's for Dinner. This is Plana, and last week we shared with you guys the Christmas recipes that would fit different people's appetite. And then this week we're gonna show you a all-time favorite hot wine recipe for beverage. And then we'll show you the chocolate cake for dessert. Today I'm going to be using a slow cooker, so I just dump everything in and let it cook. So we're gonna do that first. But if you don't have a slow cooker, don't worry, you can do it on whatever stove top you have. You just have to make sure you turn it down to medium low to bring it up to a simmer. How you can tell it's a simmer is that the side will start bubbling on the rim of the pot and you will want to turn it down to low and let it heat for about 10-15 minutes and then you will turn it off and right before you serve it warm it up but make sure you don't bring it to a boil. First of all let's look at the ingredients. We will have this apple cider. I just just choose this one because it's cheap. The main point for this is that we have mediocre ingredients but we can make it delicious. Because we're going to be boiling it, it doesn't make sense to buy like the most expensive wine on the market. So what I love about Trader Joe's is that you can get the cheapest one and it still tastes good. And this is $2.99 so go get it. You can just pretty much use any red. I like to just use bread bland because it's a little bit of everything. And then you need oranges one for going into the pot when it's boiling, one for the garnish, and you would need an apple. We won't use all of it because half of it is going to garnish. And let's look at the spice that we will need. Cinnamon stick, star anise, maybe three pieces, depending on how much you're making. I don't like the clove flavor as much, like I mentioned before. I only need to put three, but if you like it, you can go up to like six. Otherwise, it will be pretty overpowering. And then, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's really refreshing. I like that it's, it's sort of minty but it's still pretty spicy and I just put three because it's pretty powerful. Let's move into the making process. There are a few steps that we will need hot water. So I just put the hot water to boil. If you are kind of in a rush, you can pop it in the microwave for like three minutes on high. Do the apple cider first. We'll open it and then pour out two cups. Stubborn cap, oh my god. It's really hard to open. Okay, let's measure out two cups, but make sure it's this one. The dry ingredient and wet ingredients are different measuring cups, just so you know, for the ones that don't know. Make sure that you're looking at it at eye level so that you get the most precise measurement. If we pour on the side of the edge, try to eliminate the chance that the bubbles evaporating, you will get the best taste out of it. Let's pour in the wine next. The cider and the wine is in. Let's cut the fruit. So let's cut the orange first. You don't have to cut it too thin because this part we're actually gonna throw away. So it doesn't make any sense if you spent a whole bunch of time on it. Before we move to the next step, let's cut the apples. I usually like to remove the middle part because it's kind of dirty. All the water and dust collect right here. Same goes to the butt. I'm gonna cut it in half like this. It comes out like that. I think that gives the best picture when you're trying to garnish it. I'll save half for garnish, but for now, I'm gonna cut it into strips. So I left it at big chunks because we will have to take it out later and this is just the easiest way to do it. Let's put in the oranges first. Then we put in the apple. You know, the spice usually get dried and is collecting dust. Rinse it with hot water. So let's throw in the spice. So if you have some fresh cranberry handy, you can throw it in there. But if you don't have it, you can substitute it for cranberry juice or just leave it out completely. Depending 
on the power of your slow cooker. My slow cooker is semi-small and it takes a long time to cook. So I like to put it on high and I'll leave it for maybe two or three hours. That's how long it takes for my pot to heat up. But if you're cooking it on a stove top, like I said earlier, it's probably only 10-15 minutes if you want to save time that way. But this is just easy because you just leave it there and you can forget about it. But once it's kind of simmering on the side, I like to bring it to low or even just to warm. Next, we will move to the dessert. So first of all, what we want to do is that you have to have two bowls together because we are going to separate the egg whites from the egg yolk. Crack the egg. This is what I usually do. You don't have to do it like this, but I find this the easiest. If you can buy the ready-to-use egg white, you will probably need half of a cup. This egg yolk, you can make it into a custard. We don't have enough time to show you today, but if you want to learn how to make it, please comment down below and let us know and we'll show you how to make it next time. Nothing goes to waste because foo are meant to be eaten. So first of all, we put in the half cup of the egg white that we just separated. We want to beat it to foamy. Usually we like to keep it at medium speed. Put in a quarter teaspoon of cream of tartar. This will stabilize the egg white. Put in the same amount of salt. Put in a teaspoonful of vanilla extract to give it a little bit more flavor. After you see that all mixture has been evenly mixed in, we can bring it up to high speed. Check intermittently to see where the egg white is at and its foaminess. It has came to almost a soft peak because when you lift it up, it kind of stays. It's not drippy like liquid anymore, but then it still holds the form. Now we can start adding in the sugar. Sprinkle in the sugar here and there instead of adding it all at one time because all the sugar, if you add it in one time, it's going to sink to the bottom and it's not going to do anything good. You can see that it's kind of turning glossy. That's the sugar working for you. Okay, it's almost there, so I'm just going to put it on two or low to make sure that I don't overheat the egg white. Okay, you can still see that it's soft peak. It doesn't hold its shape for too long, but it's almost there. Leave it on low. Work it in slowly. I make this cake every year because it looks really cute and I think it tastes pretty good because everybody always finishes it. I like eating it, I like making it because nothing is more rewarding than you know, people liking your food. You can see the stiff peak over here, that means it's ready. So don't do anything to it anymore. Now we can put it in the pastry bag and pipe it out. You want a round tip and then put it into a pastry bag. Twist it for a little bit in the front. This is stiff peak because nothing falls out of the bowl. And this is the perfect consistency for making meringue mushrooms. Can you already guess what kind of cake we're making now? See, this is so much easier if you have a cup. Had it twisted, now we just need to release it and then tie it in the back. Let's make the caps for the mushrooms first. We had it twisted, now we just need to release it. We just want to do it like this and make sure that you don't have a harsh peak. So kind of twist it a little bit. Leave enough room between each one so that later on when they flatten out, they don't stick together. They don't have to be exactly the same. That gives you actually the realistic feel of a mushroom. None of the mushroom look alike. So I like to bang it against a flat surface a little bit. Let the mushroom flatten out a little bit so it looks more like a mushroom cap and also it let out the whatever bubble that might have been in there so you have a smoother meringue mushroom. Get a sifter, remember the cocoa powder? You just want to get just a little bit to dust on the mushroom. Work it really slowly. Tap it a little bit, sprinkle it here and there to give it more mushroomy, realistic look. I just want to kind of lift it a little bit, pretty similar to what we were making earlier. 
give it a little bit of color with the cocoa powder. Well, as long as the surface is dry, you can pull it out of the oven, but it's around an hour. Watch it closely. It's already at 225 Fahrenheit. Let's put it in the oven. One of my friends was really good at baking. She told me it's always best to use room temperature egg. So if you can set them out to let it bring up to room temperature, it's the best. But if not, don't worry about it. Just a tip. Put in three eggs, half cup of powdered sugar. Put it in all together. To start out at low, the lowest you can go because you don't want those powdered sugar to go flying. see that it's mostly incorporated, there's no big lumps anymore. I'm going to bring it up to medium high speed. So you can see that when you lift up, there's kind of like a little street trail. That means this is ready and it's pretty thick. For the egg mixture, we're going to set it aside for now. And then we'll put in a quarter cup of cocoa powder. You just want to mix up that flour and cocoa powder mixture so it's easier to sift through. And this sift I bought from Daiso, it was $1.50. You can't get better deal than that. So you want to do it on low because you can see that the powder is like going everywhere. And you want to work everything in so I'll use a tiny spatula. Try to scrape off whatever's on the edge into the bowl. So the rest I'm just going to hand mix in. Because this is not a perfectly round bowl, I'm just worried that in certain crevices or something not everything is incorporated. You want to line a 8 by 12, but today I only have 13 by 9 inch pen. And then just whatever, tin foil, parchment paper, whatever works. And then you want to grease it. So this is what we're going to do today. Okay. Pour in the cake batter into it. And you just want to scrape it even a little bit. So you want to leave it on 400 degrees Fahrenheit. We lay the slightly wet towel down and then lift it up. Half pint of heavy whipping cream. quarter cup of sugar. So you can try to taste it a little bit. I think it's sweet enough, but with the cake, it might not. So I'm going to add in another quarter cup, but a little bit less than a quarter cup. Add in a little bit of cocoa powder just to give it a bit of color. It's kind of unrealistic if the middle filling is too white. I feel like it's kind of off. Okay, I don't see any big chunks of cocoa and it's perfect actually. Wasn't as sweet as I thought it was going to be. So that's good, thank goodness. We're going to melt the chocolate. Whatever it's all like chocolate that you have, I'm just using some chocolate chip that I had laying around. For this recipe, because the meringues are super sweet, it will be best if you use bitter or unsweetened, semi-sweet chocolate to balance out the sweetness a little bit. And that's what I'm using today. What you want to do is to get a bigger pot, set it on the bottom. When it starts to bubble, put it on medium or medium low to keep it simmering. You want to put the smaller pot on top of it without touching the water because if you touch the water, it will change the texture of the chocolate and it makes it super grainy and I don't like the texture. Now it's ready, let's glue some mushrooms. So what we're gonna do 
checking out. These are the caps. These are the buttons or butts of the mushrooms. They're kind of shorter than I thought. So we'll just work with that today. That happens sometimes. This is the cap and you will just find one of these and that might fit and make it look like a mushroom. I know it's hard. So here I have a semi DIY worm keeper. Warmer to keep the glue runny. I find it easiest if you just leave the cap upside down. That way while the chocolate is hardening, it keeps it in shape. If you feel like the bottom isn't quite gluing into place, you might just have to dip more chocolate into it. The chocolate will help hold it better and also fill in whatever gap that you have. And also you don't have to stress on having everything extremely centered. No mushroom have a super centered stand. This was the whipping cream that we made earlier. It's just whipping cream and sugar with a little bit of cocoa powder to give it color. You know, over here, sometimes people struggle and it cracks. It's fine because we're going to use another frosting to cover it up, so it really doesn't matter. But it will be best if you smooth it out more evenly, then the roll will look much better. There's probably going to be some that lose out, it's fine. So because it's kind of empty and not even on the sides, I'm just going to cut it off to give it a cleaner look. So I just used the leftover melted chocolate that I had and added the whipped cream I used for the filling to so use that together with the whipped cream to create nice but sort of coarse top frosting for the Yule log. So this is ready. We're trying to fill it up. I'm gonna leave some of the spice in here as a garnish. You can choose to filter out all these apples or oranges, but they are edible and actually they are delicious. So this was the apple that was left over from earlier and I like to cut one like that and just slice it open. So you can also choose the orange peel, cut it skinnier and more even to give it a cleaner look. You can also decorate it like that. Thanks everyone! Today is the Christmas special for beverage and dessert. I hope you like it. I hope you and your family have a great time. Happy holidays! If you like us, please give us a thumbs up down below and subscribe. If you think somebody might need help preparing their Christmas dinner, feel free to share our videos with them. And if you do try out our recipes, please hashtag us on Instagram when you post a picture. We'll see you next week. Bye!